Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Let's Process That podcast with Emily and Nick. I'm Emily Christopher. And I'm Nick Connor Camp. And we are so glad that you have joined us again. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who is tuning in. We love and appreciate each and every one of you. Um, we are going to dive head first into today because it has been a reoccurring theme slash question that people want to hear about. And so we're just going to jump right in. We're going to go at this the best of our ability um, with the experience that we have, with the knowledge we have gained, the studying that we have done. We're going to dive in. And that means that today's podcast is on deconstruction, which I'm going to go ahead and preface. We know it's a hot topic. We know Mm -hmm. that some of you, as soon as you hear it, you get mad. Don't get mad. Let's just have a moment to listen. There's some of you that hear it and go, yep, I know that because it's me. And so we are going to first unpack questions that we've gotten. Um, that was one of the biggest things is that when once we've opened the email up to you guys, we started getting questions specifically tailored to deconstruction. And there's some of you right now listening and you're like, what the heck are you talking about? What is deconstruction. And we're going to unpack that as well. I'm actually, I had the, the old definition pulled up for deconstruction. Um, oh, here it is. And we're just going to jump in. And again, this is a very broad topic. There are actually podcasts that this is all they talk about. So we are not claiming here to be the experts on deconstruction. Again, I could only give you my experience and my knowledge on this um, and know that this is another thing that I'm still processing and working through. So Nick, anything to start before I read the first question and we also kind of define deconstruction as well? I would just simply say as soon as our podcast came out, this was a hot topic. People were saying, welcome to the dark side. You are now on this side of deconstruction. I'm like, wait a minute. Don't hijack my story. I'm not on that side. I just, just let's process that. So I knew we'd get here sooner or later. I do want to do a quick disclaimer that this is not simply a religious conversation. Deconstruction is way bigger than religion. We will talk mm-hmm. about religion in a little bit because that's the, the background we come out of, but it's, it's bigger than that. So I just want to put that disclaimer out there. Absolutely. So before I read um, the first question we got, because it is a pretty long question, um, I want to go ahead and put some uh, a definition behind deconstruction, especially those of you who aren't religious, don't come out of an evangelical background, um, or who are just totally unfamiliar with the term. Um, so faith deconstruction, also known as deconstructing faith, evangelical deconstruction, the deconstruction movement, or simply deconstruction, is a phenomenon within American evangelicalism in which Christians rethink their faith and jettison previously held beliefs, sometimes to the point of no longer identifying as an evangelical Christian. So that's a little definition for us. Um, And I'm going to start with the first email that we received. It says, I see something like this at least once a week on my Facebook feed, always posted by a Christian. It says something like, some of y'all didn't get God. Some of y'all didn't try God. Y'all tried church, and when the church hurt you, or you found out that liars, fornicators, and fake people also go to church, you concluded that God ain't real or that Christianity is a joke. If people can make you walk away from God, you were never in a relationship. You were just in religion. This is usually a meme of some type that is shared. My question is probably a few questions because my brain doesn't let me make things too simple. Why do you think? The Christian response to people deconstructing, deconverting, and or leaving church is to gaslight them about never being a true believer. There's always some flavor of anger, resentment, or condescension, or can, yeah, uh, sorry. This seems to me like a knee-jerk response from being hurt or rejected, but they don't seem to be able to see it. Do you think They truly believe that the only way one can change their mind about being a Christian or attending a particular church is that they never truly meant it when they were there. Have either of you seen examples of positive, helpful response by church leaders? 
This seems to be a massive issue for Christianity in America going forward. Just curious about your thoughts and observations. Love you both and love the podcast so much. So like I said, this first one is a lot. There's a lot here. And so we're going to break this up. Um, I first want to say, I'm so sorry that people feel like they have to talk down and talk negatively when someone is processing their faith, asking questions, um, especially on a public forum that tries to evoke shame on somebody. Nothing quite fires me up more than that. Nothing says this is not love than trying to put shame on somebody. So I'm very sorry that you've seen a lot of these things. You may want to unfollow a few people <laughs> if you keep seeing that. Um, so that first question, Nick, I want to toss it back to you. Um, why do we feel like a lot of the Christian response is to gaslight people into thinking that they were never true believers or like making them feel this shame um, like that was shared in this email. Yeah, I feel like I'm pretty well acquainted with this type of thought and also probably to some level participated in this type of thought as a pastor. So let me just say that right up front, that you don't know what you don't know until you know. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Um, the best example I can give, um, is I followed a pastor who taught me everything he knew. Frank Harvey is one of my heroes. He's a spiritual father. He's a mentor. He taught me everything he knew about ministry and then turned the church over to me. And it was about several years later that I realized that half of what he taught me was God. It, it was God principles. It was things about God. And half of what he taught me was just Frank. It worked for him. And I was scandalized when it all wasn't God, and half of it didn't work for me, but it all worked for him. It just half of it didn't work for me. I had to figure out my half of it. And that's the way it is with church, is that I believe that half of it's God. It works all the time, and half of it is people. It's church. It's politics. It's an organization. It's the way we do things. And it's very easy to lump all that together, first of all. So I just want to make that delineation. In anything that deals with God, there's usually a God and a human element. And, mm -hmm. and, and so for them to say, well, you never even met God at all. I don't believe that. I, 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 I believe it's very possible to have a relationship with God and the church. Those things get completely intertwined, especially if you've been in ministry. And then to separate those two things is a very painful process. I knew a pastor who I respected very much, who was very godly, loved the Lord, had lots of God thoughts and principles, walked in all that, got deeply wounded, and walked away from God. He didn't walk away. He didn't just walk away from the church. He walked all the way away from God. And you can't tell me that, hey, he had a relationship with the church, church failed him, he jumped ship. No, he became disillusioned. And life is hard. And people sometimes say, well, if there's an all-powerful God, why do you allow this to happen to me? That's a sincere, honest question. And when we give the, the world a pat answer, when we give people, community, a pat answer of, well, evidently you just formed a bad relationship with the wrong organization, that doesn't really answer their, their pain, their experience, mm -hmm. and what they're walking through. And you and I have both asked ourselves lots of questions since we've left the ministry, since we've left pastorate. I'm not going to say left the ministry, I'm still in the ministry, but pastorate, because mm -hmm. so much of that is intertwined, that it's hard to separate until you do step aside. So at first blush, the first thing I want to say is, in the church world, we hold these holy values and beliefs. And because of that, I mean, think about it. Think about throughout church history where people killed other people because of strongly held religious beliefs. They were divinely empowered, holy values, so holy, so powerful that people killed other people. And of course that was wrong. Um, and so when people have a black and white holy value, sometimes if someone begins to question, pull away, leaves that, then suddenly... The only way we can reconcile that is they have they never knew the Lord to start with, they never had a proper relationship, and of course, built on the wrong foundation, it's going to crumble. 
So that's my first thoughts. I have more, many more, but that's my first thoughts as I kick it back to you, Emily. Mm-hmm. So uh, I just hate when we try to put God in a box and putting people in a box and putting this pressure that people have to have a black and white answer about God. I just think, I mean, why would I want to serve a God that I can figure out? That doesn't make any sense to me. Like, if I can figure out everything and know all the mysteries um, of an almighty God, well, then what? That is, that, again, that just doesn't make sense. Why uh, he is, if I'm serving God, he is all powerful, all knowing, like this force. Um, and so I'm not going to have him perfectly figured out. I'm just not because he created the world and I can't do that. So there's that. Um, I, I think what just really bothers me the most about people who just pile on the shame and the, the guilt and all this anger towards people that are deconstructing or asking questions, it, that blows my mind. We were designed to explore to ask questions, to gain knowledge, to gain wisdom, to um, bask in wonder. And when we start to degrade people and make them feel stupid because they're asking questions, that bothers me. Like that really upsets me, especially coming out of um, theological academia um, from where I was in undergrad. That it just it it hurts me that people aren't allowed to ask questions or say they're wrestling with a belief or a topic um, that they're shamed for that. Um, we should be opening up to questions, and um, anytime there's questions, there's wonder there. And I yes. think that's one of the most beautiful things about life is to want to explore something. And so when we shame somebody, they're going to stop doing that. I don't want to stop somebody from asking questions or exploring. I want that to be something that they constantly crave their whole life, that they're constantly unpacking the mysteries of being human and um, and what this faith journey looks like. And so, yeah, it, it. I think just initially with that, as I see that, and it's very prevalent in evangelical circles, is I do get really upset, like heartbroken upset, not mad, which sometimes I do, but like my, if we pull back kind of what we said in the last episode, it's not the anger, it's my heart breaking, um, because they're also misrepresenting God and Jesus. So that bothers me a lot. Um, yeah, that's my initial thought on that. We can keep let unpacking me, questions, but I don't know if you got anything else. Yeah. Let me interject something real quick. For those mm -hmm. who, of us who are not religious, think of it this way. If you can imagine being raised in a conservative family and you're used to, you're registered Republican, your family's Republican, you're used to voting Republican, and along comes Donald Trump, one of the most polarizing figures of all time. And after four, term, after four years, his first term, you decide to vote Democrat because you just do not trust him. So you vote Joe Biden. And somebody comes out and says, oh my gosh, I can't believe you would vote. Joe Biden, you were never even a Republican to start with. You were never a conservative. What? You're crazy. And vice versa. I, both ways. Take that and put that on steroids. And that's what it's like to be in a religious system where mm -hmm. there's holy and there's common, where there's true and there's wrong. And it's black and white. And, and so when you watch your, your religious friends working through their faith, it's at a higher level then you could even imagine our political mm -hmm. uh, descent that we have. And so, and so sometimes, because it's so venomous and it's so important, we pull all the way away to take space and time to really ask ourselves hard questions, um, go to places that we wouldn't normally go to receive spiritual understanding. And mm -hmm. I've watched many of people who are strong Christians had a situation come up in their life where they begin to question and ask hard questions. And I agree with you, Emily. Um, I don't think God is threatened at all that we have questions, that we, uh, that we are, are working out our faith. In fact, the Bible even tells us to work out our own salvation. We need to work that out for mm -hmm. ourselves. 
not from the pulpit. And, and so even in this season, me stepping away from the pastorate, there are questions I've asked myself, and I'm doing okay. And it's so amazing to me how many people have said, hey, have you changed about this and changed about that? And I said, no, I'm just enjoying the freedom that I have today to ask questions and find answers for myself. So I just, I want our non-religious folks to understand that, that this is a step above what they may have experienced or seen, because you and I both know Republicans who grew up Republican, but the Republican Party has changed. It is not the same anymore. Just like the mm-hmm. Democrats, we know people who grew up Democrat, and the Democrat Party from 80 years ago is not the same. Well, guess what? Neither one is the same anymore, and it, it can be explosive, and that's the sort of thing that we're talking about in the church world. It goes a little higher when we're talking about God, and we're talking about holy, and we're talking about absolute truth, right? Mm-hmm, absolutely. And it is, and it's so funny, I, I was actually having this conversation um, with my boyfriend's mom because they're um, Polish immigrants um, in the Catholic Church, and she's like, I just do not understand a lot of evangelicals. Like, it's, there's very much this, you're either for us or you're against us. And there's not, it's, we just don't practice what we preach a lot of times, um, especially to what the outside world sees. And so um, it's really hard to represent that. And that's one of the reasons, um, you know, I've stepped away from a lot of church stuff. um, And I've gotten all kinds of opinions on that. um, But I felt like for me, and my relationship with God and also carrying out my purpose that I needed to get away from a lot of church stuff for a while. And I don't know how long that will be for. Um, I will, there's one church locally that I like to um, visit and it's the polar opposite of what I was raised in um, as a service and like music and just how they, everything that they do, it's very different than what I was raised in. Um, And it's been great to be able to have the freedom for something different and then to also ask questions without people judging me. Um, Because I know I I was, when I was on staff um, at a church, like there was stuff I wasn't allowed to share about like what I thought or believed because it was scandalous. Um, And it was so funny, like to be silenced basically. Um, And I mean, now I know like, well, those are topics about loving people. So I'm not going to be silent about that. Like I'm going to love everybody and I'm never going to turn people away. And um, I believe what I believe and I'm proud of my beliefs. But um, it is interesting that there is this idea in a lot of evangelical circles. And I want to say, I know this is not everybody. So not everybody say that you're, that's not everybody. I know that. But predominantly what the world sees, there it is. Um, but it is this idea of you're either with us or you're not, and it has to be black and white, um, and you have to agree with every single point or you're, you're booted out. Um, and I've seen that my whole life, period. Like, that's just what I've seen. And so it is really hard for a lot of people that are not religious or not in the evangelical communities to see that until you've stepped out. And you're like, that's a lot. That's really weird. And also, that stuff's not in the Bible. And then you start learning more about church history and you start translating the text from the Hebrew and the Greek. And you're like, we've taken a lot of liberties here. We've made up our own westernized rules. And um, I know we're about to dive into not just the religious stuff, but deconstructing um, that westernized colonized BS <laughs> that has been infiltrated into our churches in the Western world. And it is really icky and it is really bad. And the, like the nationalism and stuff like that. So again, when people are deconstructing and see people get upset, it's because they want this boxed in thing. They don't want anybody questioning them. They don't want um, anything to deter from what they believe is right. And so they get angry and they shame people, just like this example shared in this email, to feeling like they don't know God or they don't know the Bible or whatever that may be. 
And I don't think that God's scared of anybody deconstructing their religious beliefs and questioning and looking at things. I think that that is holy curiosity, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Um, Second of all, go back to what you said. You were on my staff and there were things that were non-negotiables. I mean, there there was. There was black and whites, non-negotiables. You're free probably to feel some things, but do not share that out loud. Mm -hmm. This is what Mm -hmm. we represent. And um, there are negotiables at some point, but for the, there are some big rock items. And even myself, you and I know what it's like to be in the public eye, to represent a conservative Christian evangelical view, be mm-hmm. processing and working through some things in private that we cannot share publicly, but we can talk about privately. But publicly, there can be no wrinkle whatsoever, and it's just mm-hmm. it's just part of it. And so... Um, I I just want to take responsibility for having been part of that and that co- now once we stepped out of that and suddenly had freedom for the first time to say mm-hmm. how do I feel about this and and to process it now so one of the things about m- me M is I get to go to a different church every Sunday, um, very progressive churches, very conservative churches. I, I every I get spiritual whiplash every week going back and forth. But in saying that, I get to hear reflections and beauty and ideas about Christ and loving people in ways I've never heard before. Uh, The best sermon I have ever heard on loving your enemies came from as liberal a pastor as I could ever. I had to, there were several things in the service I had to choke over to get past to hear the best sermon I've ever heard about Mm -hmm. loving your neighbors. And at this point in my, in my life, I don't have to be all or nothing. And unfortunately, many times in the church, that's what we do. Well, we know since 2020, there's a great resignation from the workplace, but there's also been a great resignation from the church. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. And back to, your, back to your original point. I mean, most people say church attendance is off 30 to 70%. So back to your original point, Emily, is... What are church leaders specifically doing to make room for people to deconstruct a little bit and figure it all out? And I would say we have a better chance today than ever because of the great resignation that we cannot do status quo anymore, that we have to make room for people to have different opinions. Let them come around at their own pace. Let them figure their own journey out. We're guides not we're guides along their path, but they get to make the final decisions instead of being uh, this holy priest that tells them exactly what they have to do. And I know priest is very biblical. I, I identify with priesthood, not saying that we don't. I'm just saying that um, the priest was always sp- supposed to explain the holy to the common. And I'm saying the common was always supposed to have a relationship with the holy, and our privilege is just being a guide along the journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I think the best thing for church leaders to do is, like you were saying, just welcome questions. Yeah. Like, don't make them feel full of shame or stupid. Um, Have a conversation. And if you disagree, say, I disagree with that. And you can yeah. you can say your things, but don't make them feel bad. And if I could say anything, please be cautious of what you're putting on social media. There are so many people that I'm like, you have no idea how terrible you're making people feel (sighs) when you degrade and and call out these things. And uh, especially those of you who are um, deep in the nationalism stuff, like... Don't start it. Emily, if you go there, I'm going to go crazy. Do not start that conversation because I will lose it right now. Well, maybe we should, because honestly, I feel like most of it that is tied um, to this this perception of evangelical churches right now um, is tied to the nationalism stuff. And it blows my mind how we would care more about po- politics than we do about loving somebody. And yeah, I see it everywhere. I'm actually... Go ahead and say some stuff because I'm pulling up what we got tagged in from one of our friends on Facebook that has to do with this exact thing. So speak your piece. Okay, so as a pastor, we're supposed to preach this universal truth of God's love. It applies to everyone. 
And then, unfortunately, two things. One, we post political posts about our political party that is disparaging towards the other political party, so much so that we lose the right to preach the gospel to half the population. And, and I'm just flabbergasted by this, that we have the opportunity as pastors to preach the greatest message ever known, the message of God's love for each individual person, that every one of us was created in the image of God. And we cannot restrain our political views, so we put them on social media and rule out half the people ever coming to our church to hear this beautiful truth. The second thing is, one day, this was really wise, by the way, one day a military guy came up to me and said, I don't know why we don't have an American flag on the platform. Well, I served in the Marine Corps. I was willing to die for our country, love America, the whole, the whole nine yards. And he says, why don't we have an American flag? And, and I said, because the American Constitution, American values, our nation, does not represent the values of the Bible. And there are several things that our nation stands for that is not in the Bible. We're here to promote the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of America. And I actually called my pastor right before I went out. So I'm getting ready to deal with this right here, right now. And he said, stop. He says, don't make one person's issue everybody's issue. If you bring this one issue in front of everybody, now they have to vote on whether they feel like they're a nationalist Christian or whether they're a kingdom Christian. And so, and and the disciples, same thing in Acts chapter 1, when Jesus came back from the dead and for 40 days he preached on the kingdom of heaven, they said, yeah, but what about Israel? And and he's like, y'all don't get it. It's bigger than a nation. It's bigger than one generation. It's bigger than... One people group, it's all people groups, all times, all nations. And, I, and I've, I, I'm concerned that the American evangelical church has gotten so wrapped up in nationalism and, partic- and then, therefore politics that they have missed the boat on the pr- pure preaching of the gospel that applies to everybody. And mm-hmm. I, I ran into it regularly. It would have it sank my ministry if I hadn't served in the Marine Corps. If I had not served in the Marine Corps... They were off with my head. It would have been gone in no time. And, and for me, the gospel, and I have friends overseas that laugh at America, and they're like, I went to a Christian concert, and they flew the American flag. We would never do that in our nation. Our nation doesn't represent the, 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 you know, the Christian way. And I said, neither does ours. And they're like, yeah, but you all, you, and you think you're holier than everybody else. So anyway, that's my lowest version rant I can go on from here. It just escalates in way. I know. And you and I are on the same page. Like, yes, I do want to read. um, I want to shout out our our friend, Kaylin Matthews. um, Oh, no. She's going to get me in more trouble. (laughs) Um, Kaylin tagged you and I in a post, and it's from Rachel Held Evans, who I just love. She passed away a few years ago, but was an amazing um, author, speaker, thinker, brilliant person. Um, And uh, she just had a quote. That said, and this was in 2016, the early church would be utterly baffled by the idea that future Christians would shame someone for not swearing allegiance to the empire. (sighs) And I'm sure you all can guess what this is referring to, um, but it's also happened many times where it, it just blows my mind how we, again, would shame, degrade, call stupid um, when people don't think or agree with everything that America does. Um, it really shows how limited we are in our knowledge of the world. Um, when we think that we are the best, we are not the highest ranked nation in education. In um, I mean, just if you honestly, if you look at, I was going to say, start listing off things, but there's literally nothing that we're like in the top for anymore. <laughs> and we have this egotistical idea and it just infiltrates our churches. And then when people start to question those things, and usually that's the first thing to go in deconstruction, you're like, whoa, I didn't realize how political my religion was. Um, then you start to say, like, I cannot associate with this. Um, and that's just truth. Like you once you see when that's once that veil has been torn back, you see a lot. Okay. So let me pause you there for a second to help some of our friends who are who are here who are not religious mm-hmm. to just take a moment and say, listen, 
I think, personally, the military and sports are two of the most important things to deal with racism. When you join the military, you put on a common uniform. In my, when I was in the Marine Corps, we called black people dark green. We called light people light green, but we were all green. Mm-hmm. When you join a certain sports team, if the school's colors are scarlet and red, you change your external color to be the team color. And there's a bonding that happens in sports and military between black, brown, yellow, red, we, white. We, we, there's a blending that happens that we represent a color bigger than ourselves. And somehow, if you've served in the military, if you've played sports, you have an awareness of racism and a belief in the common good of the people next to you that other people don't get to experience. Now, I say that as an example to say, I heard what you just said, Emily. I love America. I think she's the greatest nation that, uh, the greatest example of freedom we've ever seen. But I've traveled the world. Mm -hmm. And I have Christian brothers and sisters around the world that God is still their God, even though they fly under another flag. And to Mm -hmm. me, the kingdom flag is higher than any nationality. The fact that we were dead and now we're born again. The fact that we used to be one way, Jew, Gentile, now we're all one. And I think that the nationalism separates us from all the other brothers and sisters in Christ, puts us at a higher platform than anybody else, and I just throw I just throw that away because it disrespects our brothers and sisters who are in poverty, who are in prison, who are being uh, persecuted, who are living out their faith in other ways. To me. Being known in the spirit is more important than being known in the natural. And they'll mm-hmm. agree with me scripturally, but they won't agree with me in their practicality. Right. And that's mind blowing. <laughs> that is mind blowing. And, and again, let, and let me preface this because I don't want anybody coming after me either. Like, they're going to. I know they will. <laughs> um, but my brother is an army ranger. My father yep. has served every Absolutely. level that you possibly could um, to the United States, to the state to the county level uh, of service. And um, I believe that the idea of America is awesome. Like freedom and being able to choose and being able to have rights. But we have not executed those, those ideologies well. And the amount of like gun violence and the lack of um, care for our brothers and sisters, like you were saying, in poverty. The, the racism in this country is disgusting. And people who don't see that, again, you haven't went out and gotten your hands into it yet. Like, if you don't see those things, I don't understand. Because um, <laughs> to me, okay. I mean... So let's just go there. Let's just go <sighs> there. You can't say we're all equal at the cross. And not see a problem with the Constitution saying black people are three-fifths of a a human being. Right. I love America. But Mm -hmm. I won't put American flag inside the sanctuary because the values of God are this high and the values of man come this high. And that's all I'm trying to say. So we can't let Mm -hmm. this drive this. That's all I'm trying to say. I love (laughs) God. I love America. But nationalism cannot drive spirituality. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes and yes. And I could You're pushing me into this. I, I wasn't know. planning on going here. It's okay. It's okay. I mean She's singing now. When she starts singing, it's all over. It's true. But I just I feel like a lot of reasons, again, I just want to circle back that people feel like they have to deconstruct is because we've allowed politics into our religion. And that sh- they I just don't see how we can throw people away because they disagree with a political thing. And I try my hardest. There are people that I deeply respect and love that disagree completely with me on politics, but I don't throw them away. I don't make them feel stupid. Um, We disagree completely. And there's, there's people in my head right now that I, I disagree with so many things but I don't call them stupid. I don't throw them out. I don't bash them publicly on Facebook or Instagram or whatever. Um, 
because I don't believe that's how you treat people. And if we go back to what Christianity really is, to what the gospel is, we are to love God and love people. And if you can't hold those two things, then what the heck are we doing? If you think it's okay to publicly shame people, to call people names, and to not love other people that like you would your own family or your closest friends, then what are we doing? And so that's what I will just hop off there for right now, because there's a second part of deconstruction we want to talk about. But as we just kind of neatly put this away for a moment because i'm sure we'll get a lot of feedback um this will be the one this will be the one you've made it this far we're in double digits (sighs) now baby and emily's popping (sighs) off i'm sorry i'm not sorry um if you i mean go ahead and tell us how you feel just be nice about it um And we will we will respond absolutely 100%. At least one person will say, if you don't like it, get out of the United States. That's not what we said. <laughs> it's not what we said. We said we're proud to be Americans. We yes. love America. It doesn't belong in our sanctuaries. Yes. Period. Period. Moving on. Looking forward to your emails. Um, we want to talk about not just deconstructing your faith, but deconstructing any ideas um practices traditions that are not religious based and so we want to kind of get into talking about there may be things with like parenting that you're like "Mm, i'm not carrying that into my children's lives or there could be um any kind of ideology that we want to say hey i'm gonna take this thing that didn't benefit me from my past, from how I was raised, or another experience that I may have had, and deconstruct that. Um, I know one thing that's been brought up, um, like I said, a lot of my friends have really young children right now, mm-hmm. and they're talking about discipline. Yeah, and some I of them knew are you were like, going to go there. I was <laughs> going to go there if you didn't go there. Keep going. And so they're having to deconstruct. This is the way we had... My, I still am in a group chat with my five best friends from college, and um, it is so funny because half of us have kids and the other half don't, and our one friend, Victoria, she's from New Jersey, and she's like, the fact that y'all got spanked is mind-blowing to me. She's That's like, you got spanked with a belt or a hickory switch or a fly swatter, a spoon? They're like, she's like, I cannot understand that, and she's, she's got two little ones right now. And so we were all just laughing and talking about like, oh, yeah, like this is how I got disciplined. And so maybe that's an area. I'll let you go there since you were going to bring it up anyways, and we hadn't even talked about it. But there's certain things that were brought into our life that we may need to tear down and rebuild, deconstruct to reconstruct, um, just like our faith. But yeah, Nick, what do you think about that? All right, here we go. So I have two sons. We have two sons. Um, the oldest son I've spanked five times in his lifetime. The youngest son I've spanked five times in a day. Uh, (laughs) spanking was one of the best things that ever happened to me. I needed a spanking. I'm stubborn. I'm headstrong. My youngest son, same way. He, he, he'll tell you today. I deserved every spanking, but one. Here's what he'll tell you. And it worked for him. Um, reasoning didn't work with him. My oldest son has a soft, uh, a soft heart, soft demeanor. And so when, when we would talk to him and reason with him or take away some privilege he had, that worked for him. I firmly believe every parent is called to discipline their children. If you don't discipline them, then society has to. And society disciplines very harshly. Jail, prison, I, I just I, you have to discipline them. But how you discipline them, I really believe, is, is up to you. I have some friends who grew up and both of them were spanked. They now have a child and they're like, we tried spanking and something grieved us in our heart when we began to strike our child, that this does not feel like love. I mean, if I really love this child and they need discipline, they, their behavior is bad and it needs to be corrected, is, is, is striking my child really the way to go? And, and even my kids, you know, they both, uh, one is very quick 
to pop the little one on the butt. The other one is not. And they're working through that right now. Whether that's a timeout, taking away a privilege, whatever. I do believe we're, as parents, you better discipline your children or they'll come, they will be undisciplined and they won't care about the laws of the land and the rest of society, and they'll end up getting disciplined one way or another. But how you discipline, I think, is a topic that everyone should figure out on their own. And for me, I'm glad I was spanked. It helped me know where boundaries and lines were. I got softer consequences by getting spanked than I would have if I had suffered the consequences of my actions. So what say ye, Emily? Well, I'm going to say when I don't have kids. So... A lot of this will probably change, but I, I and I grew up getting spanked too. Um, yep. And so, but I, and my brother got, he was like your youngest yeah. all the time. Like he was just yeah. a tiny terror. Um, And then my youngest sister is an angel, was never spanked, rarely disciplined, like didn't even make our parents mad until she was in college. And it was like over something very funny, like silly. But, um, and then me, I was the one who just talked back all the time. So I got a lot of, pr and privileges taken away is what would just devastate me. Mm -hmm. Um, or, or if you took away my boom box back in the day, like mm -hmm. that was the mm -hmm. old, if you took my CD player away in the nineties, like I'm yeah. devastated. It was my lifeline. So, um, yeah, I don't really have a conclusion to that, but it is fascinating to deconstruct what you thought and knew was truth or this is the way to do something. And now it's presented in front of you like um, your two friends. They're like, no way. We're, we're, we can't do this. Like we tried it and it doesn't work for us. Um, yeah. So we'll figure out something else. But there's all kinds of stuff. Um, I know like marriage dynamics. Um, I believe very differently than what I was raised. Um, I'm going to say something super controversial. I might, I might as well, Go right? Go girl. I already did mine. Go ahead. I Oh, uh, well, I was right there with you. So like, I don't believe in like the man being the head of the household. Um, I knew you were going to go there. <laughs> I believe that it's like both people in equal partnership because I can read and write and make my own decisions. This is not biblical times where I'm illiterate. Um, and I believe I'm just accountable to myself. I am my own person. And so that is very different than how I was raised. And so there's just a lot of different things like that, that as we grow up, as our seasons of life change, we start asking a lot of questions or saying, why this? Why is it this way? Or, or something's just like absolutely do not fit. And so... There you go. You just have to deconstruct So here we go. <laughs> our, our, our disagreement. Mm -hmm. I, I love strong women. I mm -hmm. have spent my life empowering women. I disagree with you. I disagree. I think that, that the man should be the head of the family from a servant and leadership position, taking responsibility and caring. That's where I come from. And it mm -hmm. could be a generational thing. I understand the biblical piece, but it also could be a generational thing where I feel like a man can cover and undergird the whole family and let mm -hmm. them be wildly powerful and, and, and just be, chase their dreams, be everything they were supposed to be. And I know you know my heart on that. Oh, but, yeah. But part of, the, of this podcast is you and I don't talk a lot about these things ahead of time. We don't care if we agree with each other because I care about you, you care about me, and part of our joy is just processing it out loud to see where it goes. So I would disagree with you on this subject, not because I think women are less than men, but that I feel like men have a responsibility to cover in such a way that their wife is as explosive and powerful and wonderful as they can be. And so I would just disagree with you on that. However, I also understand you're intelligent, you can read and write, you could run for mayor, you could be president of the United States, and I would come under your authority. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so this is our first like disagreement. Well done. Yeah. Well, yay. And look at that. We didn't call each other stupid. I didn't tell him he was wrong. Uh, We're going to be friends after mm -hmm. this. <laughs> mm -hmm. So in conclusion, one, I want to thank you all for <laughs> sticking with us because we didn't really know how this is going to go. We really, we do our research 
And we yeah. always discuss what the topic is. And sometimes we'll have a few questions like today, this was a submitted question. Um, but I want to say thank you for the grace for us to do what we do here. And yeah. that is to publicly process through hard conversations. Um, and again, we've said this in the beginning, who we may come back in a week, a year, 10 years, if this podcast is still going, and say, I changed my mind. Yeah. I don't agree. I don't, what I believe then, actually, I kind of hope that's how I'm always. Like, I agree. I hope my, like, in a year, I have a new thought. 10 years, I have a new thought, you know? But this is a place for us to do that. And that's why we do this to open up other conversations for you to ask yourself questions, your family questions. And um, I know a lot of you do like group listening and or watch parties with this. So, you know, hopefully you made it through the end of this and now you're going to pause and have some great discussion yourself. <laughs> you're going to. <laughs> um, but those of you who are deconstructing, um, you are not alone. Uh, there's lots of dialogue out there. Like I said, there's books, there's podcasts committed just to this topic. And I want to encourage you to keep asking questions to keep your wonder and awe. Um, that is what keeps me grounded in God is that I, I love the mysteries and I love yeah. the undeniable power of his love. And that's what keeps me in relationship with him is his love. And so everything that we're doing, let's go back and ask, is this being said or done in love? And to give people the grace to change, the grace to question, the grace to move forward in whatever that looks like for them. So that's my piece. Nick, anything else? No, love it. I think today this podcast went some directions I didn't see coming. Um, I know. <laughs> You'd rather have me raw, wouldn't you? Now, at, at, the same, at the same time, that's what we want. We want to have conversation. We want to process out loud. We want to agree when we agree and disagree when we disagree. And you keep, be, keep going forward. And so mm -hmm. to those out there, we appreciate the questions. Um, if this stirred up some stuff, throw us some questions. We'll come back to it. We'll go ahead and, and unpack it some more. Um, we love America. <laughs> Just, just, but, just, just to make sure. Um, but we, we do love, love God people more. more. Yeah. yeah, we, we love, love God, God and people, people. more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. We love God and people more. Yes. And so I think I think we've done what we need to for tonight. We'll see what <laughs> happens. We'll see what happens on the backside of this coming out. Absolutely. All right, friends. Like, subscribe, follow, follow us on our individual accounts. Follow the podcast stuff on the Facebook, on the Instagram subscribe on YouTube, do all the things, share our podcast with your friends. I think that's all we've got. We will see you next time. Bye everybody. See you soon.